Okay, go live. You are live. We are okay. Wrong. Okay, we claim to be live, so hopefully you can see us back in uh, TV land. Uh, my name is St. John Walker. I'm course leader for visual effects at Norwich University of the Arts. And this is Mark Ardington, who's CG lead for uh, Ex Machina. Hi, my Hello. Mark. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for making it. It's all right. And uh, um, Mark's brought along uh, his highly prized Oscar just to prove to you that. He is who he says he is. And yes, they are heavier than they seem. So thanks. Thanks very much for making it, Mark. We've had a, a lot of questions from uh, uh, people in the uh, out there in the audience, I guess you'd say. And um, if you want to ask questions, then you can do that in a number of ways. One, you can ask them via the comments uh, um, uh, boxes on uh, at the course itself, the Future Learn course. We'll be monitoring that as we uh, as we go ahead. Uh, secondly, you can uh, ask uh, questions within Google Hangouts on air. So if you're in Google Hangouts on air, you should have a Q and A uh, uh, Q and A list. Uh, if you don't, go up to the top uh, to the little nine boxes of Google. Tap there, and you'll be able to get the Q and A uh, plugin. Uh, so that's the other way. And then you can uh, tweet in as well. We're looking for the hashtag uh, FLVFX. So try all those things to get to us. But we've got some questions from you already. So we're going to start off with some really simple ones and move through them. And I'll try and give name checks to everybody who gave us a question. All good, simple ones. Simple ones <laughs> and some really difficult ones as well. You'd be pleased to hear. So hopefully that's clear. So the reason why we're really pleased that uh, um, Mark can make it is because we think, you know, Ex Machina as a film is kind of where, in a, in a similar way to guerrilla filmmakers, Okay, it's got a big budget, but nevertheless, it still had to make do and mend, uh, and had a sort of like a guerrilla filmmaker's sort of attitude. So, uh, Mark, I guess the first thing I'd like to ask you, if that's all right, uh, before we get onto the the questions that come in, uh, is could you tell us a bit about your journey from when you were young and how you got into this kind of line of work, if you like? Okay. Um... So where do I start? Where do we start? <laughs> okay, I'll probably start when I was nine years old. Uh, I was sat watching my favourite cartoon uh, in front of the family TV and something clicked inside me because for the first time ever, the credit, well, the, the, the TV show happened, it was great. It was an episode of the Thundercats, as it happened. Oh, yeah. uh, one, of, one of my favourites. Uh, and at the end of the show, the, the credits rolled. And they'd always rolled before and I'd always sort of ignored them. But something inside me started to watch them and clicked that each name was a person and that was a job that they do and I didn't know what the jobs were but I thought making cartoons was a really cool thing to to do so I figured that that's what that's what I would I would try to do mm. that's what I would that's what I wanted for a job mm. um and by figuring out something like that at nine years old your life becomes quite easy because you can just try a route and if it doesn't work then you mm. try something else um I was naturally quite good at sort of maths arts sciences computers sort of stuff so as I sort of developed through education and stuff like that I, I all the other things you know you sort of get you get to get to choose and promote the one the subjects that you like mm. um and computers were just starting to come out into animation mm. in a big big way uh sort of some of the early pixar stuff and, and even sort of things before that and i happened upon an old laser disc in the uh school library <laughs> and i had a massive old laser disc machine that no one was using no one touched these things had never really been been seen before and they had an old sig graph um, demo of some of the shorts from that. You'll have to explain what SIGGRAPH is to people. So SIGGRAPH is the special interest group for graphics. It's the biggest sort of computer animation festival that happens in LA, well, ultimately between LA and somewhere else in, in, the, in normally in the States, I think. Mm. Um, they just had it uh, recently and I went there last year for the first time, which is great. I got to speak about Ex Machina, which oh. is really, really cool. Um, but yeah, so I, I watched that and I thought, oh wow, so you can do computer animation and make things move. And, and I you know, this was sort of me at sort of 17 mm. years old and mm. sort of figuring, figuring that out. And that really helped me choose to go on to, um, uh, for university. I went to Bournemouth University okay. to the to the computer visualization and animation um, degree there. Mm. And um, that was amazing. Yeah, I mean, because that for, for the first time, because back in, in the days that when I was doing it, which was 
<laughs> been doing it for 20 years now professionally yeah yeah uh, so it's quite a long time ago there wasn't much out there so what happened upon an old laser disc there, there was no not many books out there there was a few yeah. sort of cornerstones but they're very old animation books and stuff so to say i went through the animation route mm. and then into visual effects mm. but, um, but whereas today there's loads of material out there there's stuff mm. on the internet there's loads of books there's demos there's all these programs you can get at but there's so many more people that want to do it so for for me, there was no information to get into it, but not very many people that were trying to do it. And, yeah. and the ones that were, were scrabbling around in their bedrooms, trying stuff out. So I'd do little tests at home on my uh, Commodore Amiga. Yeah. I mean, before that, when I was very young, I would do stuff on my Spectrum where I'd pixel by pixel yeah, <laughs> yeah. program an image yeah. and then go, right. So then you'd see someone's done a game and the computer magazine might print up some some frames of mm. the different character animation. It's, oh, wow. So that, and you start to work out how it's put together. Yeah. Um, but this is really early stuff. Uh, after uni, so I studied at uni, and it was really, really good. That was great. That really taught me um, key skills, which was problem solving. The main yeah. skill was um, you can have all your artistic skills, and that's, that's great, and you, need, you definitely need them. But when, when something doesn't work, when you're pressing the button to do whatever it is you're trying to mm. create on a computer, and it doesn't work, don't just stop. You've got to think of another way and another way, and that doesn't work. So we think of another way, and and that was really really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And after Bournemouth, I made thirty copies of my show reel because in so in visual effects and in um, animation world, what matters most is is your show reel. So a show reel is is a compilation of all your clips. There's loads of them on online on YouTube and everything now, and Vimeo and all these. Um, and uh, that's your calling card. That's mm. what gets you the job. So from the projects I've done at university. Um, I made 30 show reels, went and knocked on 30 doors in London, and I got two offers of, oh, yeah. of, of a jun junior positions. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I went for one of those, and that was my way in. And that, you've, got to get, you've got to get in. It's very hard now because there's so many people trying to get in. So would you just quickly, briefly sort of say, you, know, you moved, if you like, from animation into more of a vfx -y stuff is would that be fair to say yes and and yeah. and do you, is there a big difference in the skill sets that you need for animation so let's say yeah. the pixar animation and visual effects maybe you could just say tell the viewers about that so it depends on the role you're doing so within both of these disciplines there's so many different jobs so yeah. many different roles like that when i was sitting watching all these jobs rolling up the screen at the end of the, the cartoon um mm. i specialize in animation and rigging Sort of creature work um so that means so animation is doing the actual movement but the, the rigging means putting the controls and joints and skeleton you know skeletons and muscle systems and, and making the the animator giving the animator some controls to use to be able to move it like a puppet in a computer um so i always focused on character kind of work so and you know in in both disciplines you get get lots of that mm. so i'm less whiz bangy effects and fire and exploding buildings and spaceships and all mm. that sort of thing you know i i like uh i like the character element i like the storytelling element mm. of um of, of both of those okay so and within so there's massive crossover between cartoon uh, sort of animation stuff and vfx mm -hmm. animation rigging that sort of thing as well mm. it's it's the same things you're using the same programs mm. you're doing um the same sort of things different levels so if you're working on a TV series and you're rigging a character, you've got to make it simple to use, fast to use, really robust. Mm. Whereas if you're working on a feature film mm. doing some sort of visual effects thing, there's less shots, so you're producing less footage. So, but you've got to make a much higher end rig. You're going to probably get a lot closer to it, and see, mm. you've got to worry about muscle, you've got to worry about skin, you've got to worry about all these things. It's probably realistic looking rather than cartoony. Mm. Um, and same with animation, I suppose. Um, if you if you animate on a TV series, uh, you've got to produce so much footage. So mm. on, a, on the normal kids' TV show, for example, you, you've got to, like if you're doing 78 uh, sort of seven or 10 minutes sort mm. of episode, you're making five feature films mm. <laughs> in the same yeah, time yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that someone would yeah. make a visual effect. Yeah. <laughs> but not, not necessarily every shot as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, so if you do something and it's good, it's in. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, because we've got to produce a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if you're working on adverts, that's another discipline. Again, you're working on the same thing again and again. Mm. So with the visual effects and the advertising, you mm. tend to you're working up the same stuff again mm. and again. You'll do many takes of it. Mm. You make many versions of the rigs. You'll um, 
Great. Yeah, just refine, refine, refine. Yeah, thank you. Um, and and rigging, just for people who, who aren't familiar, you could call it kind of digital puppetry in a way, isn't it? It's the yes. joints of of your characters, essentially, and controlling them. Yeah, and it mm. can go up to, like, you can sort of move on to cloth simulations and things like that, mm -hmm. and muscle stuff, and hair, yeah. and fur, and... Yeah. And some of those things came in handy, no doubt, in, in, in Ex Machina. And uh, I've got a couple of questions now about Ex Machina from sent in by people. And a lot of them are very sort of interested in when you became involved with it. So, you know, okay. what level were you? Because there's an assumption that the, there used to be an assumption that VFX is all about post production at the end of the, the, the line. But of course, with something like that, where VFX is so integral. At what level did you get called into pre-production, if you like, on Ex Machina? What's sure. what's the first thing you heard about it? So, as well as a company, we're involved from mm. very very early on, uh, you know, sort of pre-production stuff, even to the point where the the concept artwork of of Ava in this right. case, there was lots of stuff that was done beforehand, but then we would help finesse it and help with the design of her because the design of Ava is integral to how we approach the mm. effects uh, and what we can achieve for the budget, how we can save them money, how we can um, just, yeah, make everything really efficient to just give us the most bang for a buck. Yeah. But ultimately always to tell the story. Yeah. So the great, so my personal first um, experience of Ex Machina, it was my first job at Double Negative. Mm. I've been doing cartoon animation before. And um, on day one, they gave me the script. And I read the script and I just thought, wow, if we can, if we can make it on screen, what, you know what is, what is here it would be amazing the problem of course is that once you've read the script you know all the twists and turns yes and so yeah. when you're watching it back <laughs> even when you go to the cast and crew screening yeah you come out going did it work did it work because because you know what's coming <laughs> so that, that reminds me of a couple of questions here i've got from uh <clears throat> one from uh douglas moore uh hi, hi douglas um and that was really about you know did you research other androids like uh, uh, kubrick or anything like okay, that okay so the uh, two well the one main cre uh, creative force in this project was alex garland so he he wrote it he directed it he but he just was the, the guy that just pushed it through it's his creative vision andrew whitehurst was our visual effects supervisor so i worked under andrew as the cg lead um and uh, andrew and uh, alex had such a uh, correlation between what they were trying to achieve for, for the movie. One of the major parts of the brief from Alex was that he didn't want us to look at previous mm -hmm. robot design. He wanted us to create something different. He, um, but um, I'm not sure if it was him or Andrew that, that came up with, but there was a few key references. So they looked at things like uh, Formula One car, the design of suspensions and carbon fiber things and um, sort of concept bike design and stuff like that. We were really pushed into looking at, at these areas. Um, but also as another element of, of the design was, was another factor was that everything had to have a real purpose. Right. There was no bolt on bits or do some flashy lights just because it's a robot. It had to, everything served a purpose. In, everything in her whole design mm -hmm. was, was there for a reason. You know, there's, there's kind of a logic to everything and how it works and mm -hmm. how it moves and how, how it would evolve in relation to the story. It always comes back to the story. That, that's, that should always be the key thing. And, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, Alex is a, a great storyteller. And um, those are the principles he, he really pushed for, and rightly so. Yeah. Um, so, great. Uh, Raul Guerrero uh, sent in a question, which is, you, I think you've kind of answered, but really sort of he also asked sort of, um, you know, the, the team, wh when do they know that it's right the right time to use CGI as opposed to, say, practical effects or stuff? Okay. Okay. So um, there was a lot of work done before I joined the project, but I've, I sort of saw some of the stuff that they were doing. And um, so in the pre-production stage, there was a, a lot of effort went into looking at, into those things. How, you know, which parts of Ava should be costume, which parts should be prosthetics, mm -hmm. which parts should be, you know, CGI. And that comes down partially to the design choices that were made, but also sort of budgetary reasons to things like, um, originally she was supposed to wear, um, she was gonna have gloves, or were we gonna do CGI hands? Same with the feet, but very quickly it became, quite clear that that was going to be a lot more expensive. And if we could have her real hands and real feet as contact points, which is manipulating something or having, oh, I don't want to do too many plot points. Where maybe people have seen the film, I don't know. I hope they should have by now, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. But there's various things that she does in it. Well, yeah. essentially her role in the film, her pre the premise of the film is that she gets interviewed. So you would think that she doesn't do very much. She yes, just sits yeah, down and she yeah. just answers some questions. But yeah. actually, if you break down the script, there's so much going on and she has to have 
fight, she has to get dressed and undressed. And, oh, well, how, is she, how is she gonna do that? How are they gonna film that? Mm. And so we, you have to send someone on set. So Andrew, our visual effects supervisor, goes on set to yeah. advise about all these things and to collect as much reference material as possible. He will look at distances, he'll get lighting references, he'll take photographs of everything. Mm. Um, you know, um, we do scans of the set so we can see the physicality of the set and how everything goes together. Um, depend upon, I'm going off at a tangent about different things, but it doesn't That's matter. Great, yeah. um, there's, uh, so depend upon what your set's made of. So our set was made of glass quite a lot. So there's lots of ref reflections um, and refractions to worry about and how do we handle those. You might have some outdoor stuff and it's raining and you need it to be a sunny day or it's summer and you want it to be winter. There's all these different things that you have to take into account, which if you've got someone on set who can advise you about those things, you know, yeah. how much smoke are we going to put in here and should we, how are we going to get the character to go behind that in front? Oh, the character's got to walk out from the background and through it. It's like, well, how should we film that? And maybe yeah. we should do CG smoke and not do smoke. If you film your film, and then go with all your footage and go, there you go. Yeah. Right, we want to put this character in it. It's going to be expensive. So it wasn't just a question of getting Alicia to walk and then replacing her with with the the, the, the figure. There was a lot more to it than that. Uh, loads. The way, mm. okay, so the way we filmed Ex Machina, the, the, one of the other parts of the budget, we looked into um, uh, motion capture, but we didn't motion capture them. We just hand tracked her. Well, we did some automatic tracking, but a mixture of automatic and hand tracking. Now our our, our so, students have have just started to to investigate tracking, so they'll know kind of tracking in in sort of a simple two D. Yeah, right, that's okay. right. So yeah, you can get three D programs as well that will do some some tracking solutions, but always based on a two D plate, and you have to give it lens information. So we're recording all of that sort of stuff on set as well because all, all these things are so important. Um, but uh, I forgot where I was going with it. But um, so oh yeah, so we uh, we wanted to film Ex Machina in a way that was as cheap as possible and as quickly as possible to work. So we didn't want to get in the way of what the film crew were doing and we didn't want to get in the way of what the actors were trying to do with their performances. We used no green screen. Okay. So there was no setups for doing that, no worrying about what lighting's doing and all those things. We, um, so there's no motion capture as well because that would have taken ages to set up. We'd have just got in the way. Mm. Um, there was minimal tracking markers on Ava's actual costume. Um, right. We, main, we actually used uh, markers built into the design of the costume. So there's various parts. Overall, she's got this sort of uh, kind of hexagonal mesh, straight gray mesh yeah. structure over her. But then it, it's separated from different parts of the body by these uh, black band sort of um, areas, which have got these little studs that were built into the costume mm. deliberately to be tracking markers. Now, the problem that we had was that we didn't know at the time we started we didn't know how much, because we, we knew we wanted to put the mesh, we wanted to do a continuation of the mesh, but we had to see through certain areas. Mm. But we didn't know if we were going to be using the live action plate to achieve that mesh yeah. or replacing it with a CG one. Yeah. So we couldn't put pepper with lots of markers on the areas. And originally the head wasn't supposed to be, the back of the head was supposed to be costume, not CGI. Oh, right. Okay. They actually, uh, they, they, Alex really wanted it to be CGI, but they couldn't afford it. Mm. But they saved, uh, they, they kept a, um, to budget on their days mm. on the shoot and they had a contingency from that which i understand they used to pay for the extra uh, head stuff which was interesting because when all the effects are from here down yeah any headshot isn't a vfx shot right as soon as it, is, it doubled our shot count from 150 to 300 <laughs> right yeah so suddenly you got called in to do a lot more work yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was good yeah. it was the right call because yeah. it, it just made so much so much more believable uh, character that she was there and stuff. And it was just, uh, yeah, it really, yeah. really helped. Um, so, but, but we couldn't, so we, we were limited as to how many tracking markers we could put on her and what was, what was going to be replaced and what wasn't, how yeah. we, we had a very strong idea about what, what would, what it would be like, but yeah. um, how to achieve it in the final yeah, result, yeah. less so. So we did some, as soon as Andrew was on set he, and they had Alicia in the costume, he'd start sending us back some image, uh, some stills of her on set, which I was back at, at Deneg and just cobbled together the, the, the work that we had at that point. I, I set up some some um, approximate, you know, sort of rough versions and just yeah. photoshopped it together of what it could look like mm. using bits of the costume that she was wearing and overlaying them and multiplying them so we can see through and doing all sorts of different things, just having a play with it really to try and integrate the lighting and they were brilliant they absolutely loved those because that that it helped us from our, our point of view as to test how things are working yeah but from the for the film uh, from the, the crew's point of view so 
she's got, you know, you can see through the arms, you can see through the trunk, you can see through the legs, you can mm. see the back of the head. But once you do these things and you can see through various parts, it changes um, the balance of the composition of the frame. So uh, Rob Hardy, the DOP, he, he could look at those and go, you really visualize mm. where are the light areas, where are the dark areas. If I stick a light over here, am I going to catch a rim? And do what, what are we going to try and lift off of that? But the whole the whole balance of composition from light and dark areas changes when you can see through stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then someone like the actor Donald Gleason, who played yeah. uh, Caleb in the film, when yeah. he meets Ava uh, mm. uh, for the first time, he has an idea of what's he going to see, mm. what's she going to look like. Yeah. He's not going to look at her in the eyes like when you meet a normal person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going to look up and down. <laughs> what? Oh my god! Yeah. But and he can understand. Oh, where's the detail? What's what, what sort of impression am I going to yeah. be given when I when I first see yeah. her? So that's really interesting. The kind of like the the art side coming Definitely. in, you know, Absolutely. and being very important to the the look and the, the concept design. And that that comes back to a few of the questions that we've been asked. I think it might be a, a good idea now if I call on my uh, uh, one of my sort of uh, minions behind the scenes. Eric, uh, I don't know. Eric, screen share the trailer for us of um, uh, the film. We've uh, some of you may not have, uh, have caught up with the the film, so we just thought of now would be a good idea to show the trailer. So I'm hoping that uh, Eric will give me a uh, a sort of uh, if you just go to the screen share and then the screen share the red the green button and then. No. It should be on another tab. Um, okay, well, whilst we're trying to sort that out, I think... Uh, Let's uh, reenact it. We'll yeah. reenact the trailer. <laughs> yeah, that's I right. should have brought the costume. I'll be Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> I get all the good roles. But uh, whilst we're trying to sort that out, uh, uh, we'll just kind of move on. Um, and um, I think these these are kind of questions really about... Uh, people were very interested in the idea that it was a, a, a kind of a low budget in in one way okay. and how you, how you dealt with that. And... Uh, 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 Guido uh, Albanese had a question. How how do you how did you get the budget? Uh, although it's small compared to the big Hollywood movies, so uh, um, why did they believe in the project? So he's sort of saying there, you know, why was it so small if they believed in the project? But also, you know, uh, it's, it, I don't know. This is a, this is a question. This isn't. It's not your On department. No, that's no. right. Yeah, yeah. So this is a question yeah. for DNA, who yeah. were one of the main. Well, that's drivers, that's fine. And there, there's your together, answer. They put together the money for that. Uh, I think that uh, I would guess yeah. that based on Alex's track record. So he wrote the beach. Yeah. Did the screenplay for Twenty Eight Days Later. Yes. He did Dread. He done. Oh, he's done so many. Yeah. So many things. So he's got. A, it, he's had a progression through his career. Mm. I think the Hollywood money is all about risk. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But then if they're not if it's not a big budget it's yeah. not a big risk yes but it's still lots of money yeah yeah that's so true. I, true but i don't really know very much about that no so that's that's fine well let's let's move on to a, a another question i've got here um you know obviously you cut your cloth to suit the budget as as, as is always the case you know were there any sort of particular sort of workarounds that you were particularly proud of to do with sort of uh that you had to work in a very inventive different way com compared to if you had you know, 200 million or whatever. Right, okay. Um, so Andrew Whitehurst, the visual effects supervisor, mm. who, who he's the top guy on, our, on, on the CGI side. Mm. He wanted every single pound, dollar, whatever it was yeah. done in, uh, to be on screen. Yeah. So with absolute minimal wastage and everything that was, everything that we did was, was every decision was made to make sure that we end up maximum effort on screen. Um, the best tool for that is your own creativity and the creativity of the director yeah. in terms of the creative choices that they make along the way. Mm -hmm. So the planning stages mm. are, that's, that's the, the best thing that you can do mm. uh, to make the, like you, you can go on some, some directors like to storyboard their sequences so that yeah. they know exactly what they're filming on the day and they go out and they do that and they can talk about it to the, the CGI guys if there's CGI involved. Um, but we we didn't do anything clever. Mm. We did a lot of simple things very well. Mm. And we, yeah, we put in the, the artistry and the hard work to do that yeah. well. There was a few technical inventions that I did in the rig that yeah. would make life easier for, for the body trackers. Mm. So we have a whole had a whole team of people that would be there tracking our motions and sometimes using the automatic souls but then always refining them and always adding their own artistry to it um 
and there was there was one so there were little things we invented like uh in i don't know how, how many how much technical stuff to go into i'll keep it light there's inverse kinematics which um, and forward Ooh, kinematics yes. right so you can control a character by rotating each bit one thing at a time or you can stick it on a and um, stick it sticks a controller on here and bend it here and everything is worked out automatically so on the legs you generally would use inverse kinematics because you want to track an ankle and you want to track the hips and stuff like that on the very first shot where alicia <laughs> walks into, play, uh, into frame yeah. she comes in from the side and we see her in silhouette and she's a ballerina and she walks for the role as well in a very particular way mm. and she walked in and locked her legs in such a way we couldn't do it <laughs> <laughs> right it, okay it, it bent back beyond the inverse yeah. kinematics so we had to and the guy who was tracking he spent two weeks trying to track this shot track this shot going into his daily sessions that's where we show what we've done and and the vfx mm. supervisor and the super they can all look at what's going on and give some some you know create steer it creatively yeah, yeah, yeah. he's going backwards and forwards no, not quite right. Still some wobbles in there, still this. So I invented this controller for him that meant he could do a mixture of the two, inverse kinematics and full kinematics. Right. So within half an hour, he fixed the problem that had taken him two weeks. To, <laughs> so to there's always that kind of problem solving going on behind the scenes. And um... yeah, it, every project you're doing in, in, in animation, well, yeah, in the animation industry and in the um, visual effects, you're always doing something different. Mm. You're always doing something you haven't done before. Mm. If you create a commercial or if you're doing a let's say only tv series i suppose but it's still still there's innovations everywhere you're always every day i go into work and we're doing something different yeah. but but it's always built on the same principle so i said at the beginning we did a lot of simple things very well mm -hmm. that's all we did yeah what made this film great and what got us these little shiny golden men was the creative choices yeah yeah really was yeah you know and when you say we the, this brings me to a question by uh Eamon Sulla. uh he sort of says in terms of CGI, in terms of CGI, sorry, how many 3D artists were involved in making this movie? How many people were working oh, right, okay. on it? Uh, yeah, so um, w the work was split between three main companies. Uh, so us, Double Negative, had most of it. Milk Visual Effects uh, did some extra bits and pieces, and um, a company called Utopia did some other. I think there may have been another one or two, maybe they did some little bits and pieces, but um, screen interfaces and mm. all these sorts of things. I don't know. Um, I just see the double negative side. So we did the bulk of, we did mm. sort of Ava and all the other sort of various effects and things going on. And with um, within what we were doing, so we had probably a team, a whole team, 70 to 80 people mm. of that artists, 60 to 70 of that in 3D, you said? Because yeah. we have, so we split between 3D and 2D. And so the actual 3D work is, I would probably have, I don't know, not 50 50 split probably probably more a lot more 3d artists sort of two-thirds split probably of 3d artists mm -hmm. but um yeah um when we we had some work being done in singapore and some work being done in in london so right. double negatives a company in, in london we have like a thousand people mm -hmm. in a big building and uh mm -hmm. but a thousand people don't work on yeah, 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 yeah there's lots of shows going on at the same yes, time it's yeah. like having lots of little companies all within one big company yeah, yeah. they're all working on their different projects yeah, and then yeah. you finish one and you go on to the next one all these sort of things so, so this this brings on the next predictable question again from Eamon Sire, and that is um how long did it take essentially i mean from, oh, okay right. from the start to the end uh well my involvement so i went on uh I, it was quite funny because there was a very few people on the project at the time it was myself andrew uh faye producing and uh had a couple of other people texture guy and another uh, rigger um and uh i arrived on the thursday on the friday they gave me the script on the friday andrew said to me right whatever information you need you've got to get out of me quick because i'm going off on set on wednesday and i'm leaving you in charge <laughs> <laughs> and i was new to the company right, so i had yeah, to learn yeah. lots of things i had a few friends there so i yeah. kind of had people to ask yeah but uh and that was uh so we did all this quite a long time ago like three years ago mm, now yeah, uh, that yeah. was in the summer and then we wrapped on it the following May. So, uh, so about 10 months production, uh, when the head stuff, so the brief evolved. So initially it was just gonna be the body, but then the extra work for the head came. Mm. So by Christmas, we'd done a lot of the body stuff. Mm. And then we started to work on the head things sort of just before yeah. Christmas, but everything finished in May. So the whole thing about nine months, 10 months, but that's just production. Yeah. That's yeah. like, from the moment they start filming and we got someone on set and they're sending stuff backwards and forwards. That happened before that. Yeah, well, yeah, production stuff. yeah, sure. 
Okay, um, I've got a question from Les Reed, and Les sort of asks, uh, this is kind of a very holistic, big question, what was the most important lesson or lessons you learned from making it uh, and uh, that you'll take forward to future projects? So what do you, what did you learn from this kind of fast what do we turnaround? Learn? What do we learn? Oh, per what do we learn as a company? What do we learn? You personally? A, personally? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was my first big visual effects yeah, yeah, job. Yeah, I've done yeah. some other bits and pieces yeah, before, but yeah. uh, so I learned loads. Yeah. <laughs> And I've done lots of films since. And uh, the thing I learned the most, it's about the key creative choices. That's the mm, thing. Yeah. Uh, and having story driven effects, things that, you know, there's a lot, you put a lot of work into making these things. So we should at least have a, a good story. They should be there for a reason. Yeah. Not, it should drive it forward. Not gratuitous. Yes, mm. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and um, that's that's interestingly enough, you know, what a lot of people have been saying on the course is that, you know, story is very important and you have to sort of make it, you know, we hope that the, the students on the course will start to sort of understand that visual effects can help them to tell new or different stories as well. But story is key, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Mm. I mean, could you have made this film, Ex Machina, yeah. five years ago? Well, mm. we made it three years ago. Could you make it eight years ago? Uh, yeah. Probably, well, you probably could actually, because we were just doing some things well, but were they ready? I don't know. But I guess the technology does let us make new stories, different stories. It yeah. expands what we can do, but a good story is a good story. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, let's move on to another question then, uh, and then I'll ask sort of Scott if there are any questions coming in, because uh, I'm going on the questions that uh, were in uh, earlier. But um, this is kind of a, you'll like this one, this is a meaty question. It's from uh, Sham Shadeen A. Charles, and he's kind of asking, what is the future of VFX in filmmaking? So where do you see VFX going? Uh, okay. uh, hopefully more storytelling driven visual effects. Mm -hmm. That's what I would like to see. Mm -hmm. uh, but it probably won't be. <laughs> we get yeah. a lot of films which are so heavily visual effects that sometimes you're not sure if you're watching a game or a, what, what are we watching? We've, we've lost so much of reality. Yeah. The one thing that really annoys me at the moment, I don't know, I mean, I'll probably end up working on a film with one of these in it next. A lot of films have these shots that just go on for and they're stitching mm. different things together and does it add anything? Sometimes, yes. In gravity, yes, it worked. Everyone's got one of these shots that starts somewhere and ends somewhere else via another thing, and it's all just one long continuous take. And for me, we've lost. Well, by doing that, it feels more like you're on a watching it. You're more on a ride. Yeah. They're trying to make you feel immersed in the scene, but to me, it feels like you're on some sort of virtual reality ride. Yes. Where you're just sat there and you're taken and you're, and it's a very different experience. Yeah. Um, why not just cut <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and build a film? And there's a whole art of cinematography and filmmaking that, that's been developed for over a long time and we're very uh, attuned to. We, and yeah, and yeah. why not just use that? Yeah. And that grounds, that grounds it more in reality because you get less of a CG takeover of a person, you know, doing some acrobatic thing and then landing somewhere else and running off. And some of the things are so physically implausible. Yes, yes. That... Uh, yeah, but yeah. I'll probably end up doing one of these. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's an important thing, isn't it? Because when you work in the industry, you you, you don't necessarily choose what you, you work on. No, you don't. Yeah, yeah. But uh, if you don't like necessarily the nature of what yeah. you do, there's always other things that you do enjoy. Yeah. Like for me, I like the technical challenges as well. Or um, I, you know, like the people you work with. Yeah, you like, yeah. uh, there's all these things. You know, you're not going to every movie you work on isn't going to be the wow, oh, wow, that's great. Oh, wow, that's great. Yeah, oh, there's, yeah. there's always going to be. You know, yeah. Yeah, kind of ebb and flow according to what what your tastes are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Well, I'll, I'll hand over now to Scott. I've got loads more questions written down from before, but Scott, is there anything coming in that you think? Yeah, uh, I've got one here from Jack. He says, um, "How do you see the visual effects uh, industry developing in London for the future, especially composition? On average, what department in the VFX workflow gets the most amount of time on a shoot? On a shot. Oh, it's all right." right. <laughs> Uh, okay, how do we see how do I see the visual effects industry developing in line for the future? Wow, that's hard. Yeah, uh, it's very difficult. It's a global yeah. industry. Yeah, and we're competing for tax breaks everywhere, mm. and the work is ebbing and flowing mm. around the world according mm. to what's going on with those things. It's a bit of a merry-go-round. If you're a, a young person getting into the industry, it's great because you can go off and come work in Vancouver, or yeah. we go to Sydney, we go here, we go there, we, and and that's that's wonderful. 
if you're an older guy like me, <laughs> you're less interested. So you hope that the visual effects industry will have a very good future yeah, yeah. in London. Um, I have no idea what's going to happen. It's going to be very different. It, it's always changing. Um, and I guess Jack, part of Jack's question there was about the compositing. And so to come, yeah, sorry, yeah. to come to compositing, uh, com, com, the role of compositing is, is always obviously really important. But in terms of how much time was spent on the shot, it, um, he was asking, I think, uh, depends on the shot, depends what you're doing, depends on the nature of the shot. If some shots are just done in compositing, some shots are mostly done in 3D with compositing being, being mm. less, but there's always an element of compositing. They make our work look brilliant. Yeah, yes. Compositors do the final zhuzh yeah. that makes it all look great. Yeah. We like compositors a lot. <laughs> and they're always the one at the end. So if there's any delays, they're the ones that get impacted in time and yeah. they're the ones that end up working late. Yeah. And that, that, that They're at the end of the Appreciate the queue, your compositors. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yes. Okay, thanks. Scott, do you think that was uh, the answer? Uh, there's a single one here. I'm oh, yeah. I'm going to say their name. Uh, loan, I'll say that part of the loan. Um, what would be your advice to young filmmakers slash VFX artists? Okay, okay, uh, just, uh, just, just in case we missed that, sorry, uh, oh, sorry. It was a, just a question about advice to uh, young filmmakers and VFX artists. What would I say? Uh, I'd say follow your passion, follow your dreams, do what interests you. Get a job where you go to work every day and it's not a real job because you're just mucking about doing visual effects. You're not mucking about, yeah, but you're having a good time. Uh, you, and you're, you're striving to create something really, really wonderful with other other people. And um, to get into it, wow, do stuff at home, do do your own thing. I started off one of the early things I did were probably one of my first VFX shot. I think was because uh, I was working in an animation company at the time, but I wanted to do stuff with live action as well and just muck around. So I wanted to to test how I could do things. So I I, I got I was in the studio, and I just had a camera just filming, and it was I, I film just a static shot. And it was just me <laughs> jumping around like an idiot, like a loon, in various parts of the room. Jumped on a desk, jumped here, jumped there. And then I did a clean play. And I cut it all together so that I would disappear and appear at various parts of the room. And then I covered up. So I was literally just going, zoop, I'll here, all land in this bit. And then I'd do a movement to jump off. And then I'd go, zoop, and I'd land in this bit. And, and then I, I covered it all up. I was doing a test just to, uh, I had a cube. I'd float around from one bit of the room to another, and I'd appear there. And I just covered it with a load of lens flares that would grow out and cover the body and then boom, and I'd be there. And it worked. But yes. It was cheap and it was awful, yeah. and it, but it was great. And it was uh, and it was just so much fun. Have fun. Just have fun. Well, that, that's that's interesting because Stephen Ansel I, I asked you a question about what was the cheapest effect you've ever used in the, in the movie uh, but had the biggest impact? I think what he's trying to get at there is, you know, what's the most quick and effective maybe simple effect that you've done in in ex machina or, or elsewhere mm. i guess something really simple it rather just goes together and it's all there's so many steps involved it's like built like building all these blocks together no one piece makes it yeah. uh, they're all yeah. they all join together to to become the sort of significant whole i i guess yeah uh but the one best not effect but the one best thing that makes the most significant contribution is the creative choices yeah yeah and the best way to, uh, and the creative choices aren't made necessarily by me. They're made by Andrew. They're made by Alex. Uh, you know, mm. and and it's you can if you can steer the project creatively in a very efficient way, you can make something really good. Yeah, and you you know you have to plan it all, but and for that you need experience, so it's really hard. But you can still lean on people that have experience and find someone that know you know that knows about some of these things. Talk to them. Yeah. There's loads of things, uh, tutorials online about how they did things. Read Cinefix magazine because yeah. you know they tell you behind the scenes what they did here and there. But yeah, you got to remember as well that some of the some of the simplest effects were done in movies years and years ago, thirty years ago, forty years ago. I mean, you know, longer than that. We've been yeah. doing effects, very simple in camera, very simple post stuff. Uh, it worked then. Yeah, the audience's eyes are becoming more attuned, and you have to, you know, some of it doesn't hold up. Some does. Yeah, go and look at Jurassic Park. Still looks amazing today. Yeah, that's incredible. True. Absolutely that's incredible. True. And what were the kind of films or, or, or sort of TV that influenced you, or you know, you thought, "Wow, that's amazing!" as as you were sort of learning the tricks of the trade. Ah, tricky. I like, I like Back to the Future. Mm. I like Ghostbusters. Yeah. But then I like uh, Shaun of the Dead and all the Edgar Wright stuff. That's all yeah, brilliant. Uh, I like story driven stuff. I like tight stories. I like as good as it gets. Ah, brilliant. 
<laughs> I don't know. Uh, I like to. I like stuff to entertain. I got into cartoony animation stuff because I wanted to entertain, mm. and the visual effects stuff's like, wow, can I do something like that? Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, that's a different focus though. From what I was saying before, rather than thinking about telling a story from a or doing a funny little gag, you're just focused on one bit of it, one shot. So many people involved. So you're just doing this shot, that shot. We've been sort of uh, dealing with uh, green screen, and a lot of people have been sort of uh, in this week are sort of doing green screen exercises and, and learning a bit about green screen is not you just press a button and hey presto, it's, it's a lot more complex than that. I don't know if you've had an experience of green screen uh, or, or have any tips or sort of. Uh, so it's not knowledge. really my department, that's no. a 2D department, but I have done it in the past. Yeah. <laughs> and things, <laughs> how you film it, how you light it is really, really important and, and getting the spillage right. And then you can get. You can sit there for hours, oh, years ago, I'll be sitting there on After Effects, fiddling with numbers to try and get it to be right and make it a bit blurry and yeah, cutting it yeah, in. Yeah. And it looked great for that frame. And then yeah. I move it through and it'll look awful, really hard. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, because that's what, uh, important that people know that. So that's yeah. great. Scott, do we have any more questions? I can uh, move on if, uh, if not. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Uh, Harris here. Have you ever? Passionately disagreed creatively with oh, yeah. the VFX shot you had to make and felt it should have been done differently from what happened. That's a good question from, from Harris there. It's about whether there's been conflict flicked on, uh, amongst the team about how a certain shot should be done. So, uh, has that happened to you? And how do you negotiate any sort of differences in opinion? I'd say it happens all the time. Uh, can I think of a specific example? That's much harder. Um, you work well if you're if you're in a company company like Dneg you're all, you're working with so many other people and unless you're the VFX supervisor you're not in charge so yeah. you're going to get overruled about the way to do things all the time and they get overruled by the director and everyone who's on the client side mm. and you might have a creative producer involved or the head of the studio could wade in and there's so many people trying to make you know it's very rare to get a situation like we had with Ex Machina where Alex was just they let him make the film right and we helped him yeah yeah um, so so uh, sometimes the, the, there are cases where you know somebody much higher up the food chain than you will say i want that change to be a pink elephant or whatever and you well, yeah, the show i'm working on at the moment we got yeah we're having design changes from the client uh yeah. for the better or for worse yeah it's all an opinion yeah. i don't know yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very good question but a very difficult question i yeah. don't I don't really feel I've answered it very well. But generally, the, 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 there comes a point when someone has to make a decision, doesn't there? There comes a point where seniority rules. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, well, that's a good point. Though. That's an important lesson about... Yeah. In, so in the animation world, I felt like less of a small cog in a big machine. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the visual effects world, in a big company, you're a small cog in a big machine. Yeah. You get less say. Yeah. And again, come back to the TV animation stuff as well. You get to do more. If you do something good, it's in. Yeah. To do something, everyone's like, wow, well, that was good, well done. As, as long as it's in character, in the style of the show, and all those things, then it, you know, if you do something good, it's, yeah. it's included. Yeah, great. Um, I'm going to hand over to Scott again. Another question, Scott? Yeah, I like this one from Tracy. What is your favourite character to create? Oh, Tracy's asking, what's your favourite character to create? Of all the characters I assume that you've, done. you've made, I mean, hmm. <laughs> this is the, the the sound hasn't gone, thinking, folks. It's just, you're just thinking. Okay. Uh, favorite character to create to animate the character. That, oh, yeah, it's got a. Are some kind of characters more difficult to handle than others? Because so a multi-limbed spider, for instance. Or... Yeah, they're difficult to make and they're difficult to animate. Yeah. But uh, I always think of the character and think of the personality that's behind it. And some, you know, so it's coming. If it's an animated character coming from the voice, it's coming from the physicality, it's yeah. coming from what's written in the script for them to do. It's, yes. You know, story is character, character is story. And uh, so my favourites tend to come from that. So I'd probably say from all the things I've ever worked on would probably be something, some of the characters, all the characters from The Secret Show. <laughs> Secret Show was a kids' TV show. Right. It was on uh, BBC. It went around the world. It was made out of Collingwood O'Hare. And I animated on that. I didn't do any rigging on it. It's a 2D cutout style show. Okay, yeah. Uh, they're yeah. The, they're the, probably the best characters I've worked with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. They're great. Uh, 
I'm checking it on time. I'm not quite sure what the time is because our clock, I think, is wrong. So uh, at what time? Okay, right. So we're coming towards the end. So maybe we'll take a, another question, a final question or two. So your chance now to just uh, ask one final question. And of course, you know, I think we'll maybe send on some questions afterwards, if it's all right with you, after the transmission to you. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you'd like to respond, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, without sort of taking part of your the rest of your busy life but uh <laughs> scott yeah jack asks um what is the number one most important thing to remember to create good dfx okay just so people just in case people didn't hear that i'm not trying to butt in but uh, jack was saying what's the most important the number one most important thing to create great visual effects write a good script <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> after that yeah plan it yeah yeah. If you don't do visual effects yourself, talk to someone who does. Yeah. They'll break down the script and they'll look at all the different things you're trying to achieve. They'll help you uh, find ways that are achievable. Uh, we can make visual effects that will do absolutely anything. Mm -hmm. oh, the only limitation is your imagination. But can you afford them? <laughs> How many days will it take to do it? Yeah. How many people yeah. will it take to do it? So to, do, to create something realistic for your story, to get something, ultimately you want to put something on the screen, you want to communicate with an audience. Uh, yeah, plan it. Right. Break it down, plan it, talk to someone who, if you don't do it yourself, talk to someone who who is experienced. Yeah. Great. Okay, let's sneak, uh, sneak another question in, if we may, Scott. Have you... Have you, Jack asks as well. Jack, I, I think I know who Jack is as well. <laughs> what would be your advice um, on creating a demo reel? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, demo reels, I was just doing a break, uh, going doing some feedback for a, a student the other day for a demo reel. He'd done really good stuff, um, but he put it all in the wrong order. He'd, uh, he'd have your best stuff at the beginning, have wonderful stuff in the middle too, but it's not your best stuff, but it should still be as good as you can get it and end strong as well. He'd started with, he'd, he'd done it in an order, probably a chronological order of how he'd created it. So his simple stuff, and then it was getting more complex, more complex, and he had some really technical stuff that he put at the end. And the best stuff for the job he was going for, the best stuff was get the technical stuff at the beginning because you have 30 seconds to make the impression. Your demo reel may be two minutes, three minutes long, I don't know, depends what you know, half an hour, yeah. what you're doing. <laughs> um, people will form their opinion within the first 30 seconds. And um, once they form that opinion, it's really hard. Yeah. So he, he's going to recut that reel now. Yeah. And it will, people will view it in a completely different way. Um, and depends what you're trying to show. Uh, so he was doing rigging show reel, that's really hard. Because um, you're trying to show how things move, and there's lots and lots of information to get across. So you're trying to help him show ways to present that in a nice way. But if you're just doing, uh, if you're doing visual effects, uh, know your audience, know yeah, yeah. know who you're sending yeah. it to. Ideally, cut a different reel for each company that you're going to send it to, and each position. It's not very realistic, though, is it? Um, I started off with one show reel when I first was getting going. I reached a point where I, because I wanted to do animation and rigging and some of it was cartoony and I wanted to show higher end stuff. So I had three reels. Mm. I was sending and depending upon what job I was going for, I'd send different ones. Um, it makes a difference if you're showing the show reel to a producer or if you're showing the show reel to an artist because they both look for different things. Yeah. If, uh, especially with something like advertising, some producers are savvy about how things are made and all of that, but some just want to see brands. They just want to see what brand names you work. Oh yeah, you worked on that. Oh, you worked on that. You worked on that. Tick, 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 tick. Let's get that guy in or let's get that girl in. We have a chat. Da, da, da. Whereas the artists will look at it. They don't care what names are on it. They don't care if it's rendered, if it's an animation show. They just want to see the skill, the artistry, what yeah. you're doing. What were your creative choices? What were your, what were your, your you know, the judgments that you made I think it's work. really interesting how you've brought um, things back always to that idea. It's, it's about creative choices, not the software, not the absolutely so great. Yeah, and I think we're we're at the end now of, of our session. So, okay. just like to say, Mark Hardington, thanks very much for making this session, and it's been very informative. It'll be there for posterity on YouTube, and we hope to see you again. <laughs> and do drop in on the uh, the course and have a look around. You didn't and... tell me it'll be on YouTube. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you very much for having me. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. And thank you very much for listening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers.